Galatians chapter 3. You foolish Galatians. Isn't that a way to start a letter? You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed and crucified. In other words, you know the story. Stop playing. I like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? At the beginning, by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask you, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. I want to take my thought out of the third verse right there where it says, are you so foolish? I hate to keep using that word. At the beginning, by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish? Somebody say finish by means of the flesh or by the works. I'm going to use for a simple subject this morning, the next few moments I have, final destinations. That's what I want to talk to you about, final destinations. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you've been coming to this church for the last several months, you know that I've been talking to our church about being intentional. Intentional about the things of God. Not being random, but being intentional. That the things that we're doing, the things that we're launching, that all of it is a thought process that we put in place. And we're not just throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. But we're trying to make sure that all of our energies, our efforts, our resources, our time, and our talents are put into a target that we are trying to hit. And while I was thinking about that this week, I came across this interesting quote regarding good intentions. It says this. It said, good intentions are the starting point of every journey, but the destination depends on the choices we make along the way. I'm gonna read it again. Good intentions are the starting point of every journey, but the destination depends on the choices we make along the way, meaning that everybody starts out good, don't always end up good. That everybody who starts out in a great way, in a good way, and in a good direction doesn't always end up at a good destination which suggests to me that good intentions is not enough. It's not enough to just say, I meant to do good. I intended to do good. That good intentions must be backed up by good choices if we want good results. Are you following me this morning? Now, to be sure, in, in anything anytime you do anything consistently on a high level, it's not easy. Follow what I'm saying? It's not, anytime you get ready to do something great or do something important, it's not easy because it requires a little something called discipline. And it's very hard to be disciplined at things. I don't know about you, but it's challenging sometimes to commit to things that require discipline, like losing weight. Yeah, somebody blue. <laughs> you know why? Because there's always conflicting and competing attention trying to things are having. That anytime you start out something that requires discipline, there's always something completing and competing for your attention. In fact, while you're sitting here this morning, you are having competing and completing thoughts. That for a few moments while I'm speaking, you're trying to focus on what I'm saying. You're trying to get it. You're trying to make sure you absorb it. But right now, there are things going through your mind that are competing uh, and challenging your thought process. I'm thinking about the roast at home. I'm thinking about <laughs> what I wore today. I'm thinking about what's going to be at work there. Because there's, anytime you get ready to do something good, you're always dealing with completing and conflicting attention. And herein lies the issue. It's not what we do occasionally, but what we do consistently that defines who you are. It's not the random things you do every once in a while that define who you are. It's the things that you do every day consistently that most people are good at starting things, it's the follow through that's the problem. And you see it all the time. I had good intentions, I meant to do it, I had in my mind to do it, it was in my heart to do it, and so because it was in my heart to do it, I began, I started. Kudos for you for starting. 
Because many people have not even begun the process. Let me stop right there. That there are many people who are sitting in doulessness and don't get anything done because they think it's magic. They think it's hocus pocus. They think things just happen. But everybody who's successful knows that you have to start somewhere. That the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. So I, I applaud you for at least starting. But, but you got to go more than just beginning. You see? see, see, you have good intentions. I began with good purposes in mind. That's how we all start out, with lofty ideas. I began with clear focus. I began with integrity and excellence. I began with a good attitude. I began with a desire to be an exemplary employee. When I came on this job, I intended to be employee of the month. <laughs> Every month, I was so excited to do good quality work. When I went to the altar, it was my intention to be a good wife and a good husband. Nobody gets married intending to be crazy. <laughs> Nobody goes to the altar and says, I'm just going to be the biggest knucklehead that I can possibly be. We all go to the altar intending to be the best husband, the best wife. I want to be hashtag relationship goals. I want everybody to look at me and be able to use me as a test model to say, I want my marriage to be like them. That's how we start. Mm. Oh, my married people looking nervous. I, I, when I had this baby, it was my intention to be an excellent parent. I wanted to be parent of the year. Some of us that grew up in, in, in strange household and difficult circumstances, you came out of a household that you said that when I have a child, I'm not going to raise my child like I was raised. That the things that I went through were unnecessary and the things I went through were crazy. And so I determined that when I have my kids, I'm never going to treat my kids like that. I'm never going to have them go through what I go through. And so when I had this little baby in my hands, I brought him home thinking, I'm going to be an excellent parent. <laughs> and then life happens. <laughs> I started out with all these ideas. My intentions were to do it well, but life happens. More specifically, time happens. And over time, I end up being or doing something that I never intended. Where are my real people in here? Over time, I end up being something or being someone or doing things that I never even intended. You couldn't have told me in a thousand years that I would have started here and ended up here. How did I get here? And the greater question is why? You know why? Because the choices, because of the choices that we make along the way. Now where I've ended up versus where I started is vastly different. Now who I have become versus who I was trying to be is as different as night and day. And it happened to me so gradually that I didn't even notice. It happens to me so gradually that it became second nature. That when I look at people sometimes spiritually, looking at you now versus how you looked six months ago is like night and day. And not even always in a good way. It's almost like people, you know how you do when you pull out old pictures of yourself and you have your old picture versus your new picture. And I didn't even notice until I put the new picture up. I don't put on all this weight. I mean, I faked it for a while because I said, well, it's a little bit tight. Just get something bigger. <laughs> Try to hide it, right? But the truth be told, if I hold the two things up against each other, I can see that where I started versus where I began may be vastly different. And so in our text, Paul is talking to the churches at Galatia, and uh, he, he's somewhat perplexed and, and, quite frankly, a little bit annoyed. Anytime you start calling somebody foolish, you open the letter with, foolish! <laughs> Foolery! <laughs> he, you can read into his pages, I'm annoyed, I'm ticked off. What is this foolery I'm looking at here? Because these were some of the churches that he planted on his first missionary journey. Man, when he first started preaching, he was on fire. He came out the gate planting churches, winning souls, getting folks filled with the Holy Ghost. And so these churches that he had founded, he wanted to come back through and just check on them and see how things were going. So these were churches that he had actually birthed in the spirit. Right? 
There's about no drive-by. He spent time with them. He spent, he labored with them. He pushed them out in the spirit. Imagine a mother who pushes out a baby who's pregnant and, and births a baby. I don't think, I don't know, because I'm a man, I never had none. But I would think if you ever birthed a child, you wouldn't forget that experience. Where are my ladies at? Y'all up? Where are my mothers at in here? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I've never done it before myself, but I would figure if I pushed something out of my body like that, if I pushed an eight pound anything out of my body, I probably, I probably wouldn't forget that experience. That's what it was like for Paul. It was like I birthed you in the spirit. I labored with you. I carried you. I nurtured you. And I finally pushed you out. In his mind, you had a genuine experience with God. He knew that God had done something in their life. There was no question about it. You guys came from good stock. I saw you with my own eyes. I witnessed the Holy Spirit coming into your life. Uh, put a pin right there. Some of the people that are being birthed in the spirit right now, I, I have to question. I have to really question if you had a genuine experience with God because there's something about having a genuine experience with God that you cannot hide. Now, there's a whole, whole lot of people that's faking and shaking and play in church, but I'm telling you, when you have a genuine experience with God, there is something about having him come into your life. You ain't got to ask nobody, was that God? You ain't got to ask nobody, was that the Holy Spirit? You ain't got to stand up and say, I wonder if that was God or not. There's something about having a genuine experience with God that it would be showing up in your life. It'll show up in how you talk. It'll show up in how you walk. There should be a difference between night and day. I'm not talking about people just slapped hands on you and you walk to church. I'm not talking about shaking the hand of the pastor and joining the church. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit that overcomes you and overwhelms you and changes you and changes you. Your desires and changes how you walk and how you talk. Is there anybody in here who's had a genuine experience with God? Where, where are you at if you had a genuine experience with God? This is the challenge with people sometimes who are brought up in church. Because sometimes they've been around church so long that they've been around it, but they've been in church, but church ain't been in you. Versus somebody who comes in off the street who was a drug dealer, who was a drunk, who was an alcoholic, and the Holy Spirit puts his hands on them. There is no way you can deny that. Look at somebody say something happened to me. So he knew what was in them. He was there. He preached. He ministered. He saw it fall on them. It's almost like somebody who cooks. He knew what was in him. Yeah. It's like somebody who cooks versus going to the fast food restaurant. At least you know what's in it. Come on, where are my cooks at in here? You, you can go to McDonald's, you can go to Burger King, but you don't know what's in it. Could be anything in it. Pesticides, rodent hair, roaches, could be anything. You just gobbling it down. But when you cook it yourself, see, yeah, that's the beauty of cooking your own food. At least you know what's in it. I know what's in here. And so when he tasted them, he said, listen here, I know what's in you. You come from good stock. I know it's down in you. Which is why it is. This is how it is when you follow good leadership. When you follow good leadership, you tend to take on some of their attributes. I'm not talking about being a clone. I'm not talking about being a carbon copy. But when you have good leadership, you tend to copy some of those good attributes. So, so, so when he left them, he expected them to continue to grow in grace, Charlene. I got you started. You started out good. Foundation is set. Holy Spirit's alive in your life. I know what happens when God plants something because he which has begun a good work in you shall continue until the day of Jesus Christ. So I know if God got his hand on you that he's taking you somewhere. That if God didn't, be, didn't plan to finish something in your life, he would have never even started. So, so, so now that I've started you like a plan, I can go away and come back. And I expected you to be growing in grace. But, 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 but instead, he returned to a people that didn't look nothing like him. They didn't look nothing like him. It's like being a father of a child don't look nothing like you. Here I am, dark with kinky hair, and you... I'm looking over my glasses. This child ought to have something that looked like me, an eye, a nose, a knee, or something. <laughs> he 
even their spiritual father and came back and said, you don't look nothing like me. This ain't what I planted. In fact, they seem powerless. Though you were born in something powerful. You were born in something that would change the world. And I came back and you don't look nothing like me. So look at, uh, he started asking, asking questions. He said, what happened to you? Typically, now, let me say this here. Typically when people fall back, they don't fall back into something. They slide back. Yeah. People don't typically, typically just go out and fall into something. They slide. That's why we call it backsliding. It's, it's gradual. It's slow. It's diminishing. You don't even notice it. The room is turning, and you haven't even noticed it. And I, they have, a, they have a, a restaurant in Dallas called the Reunion Tower, and, and it's the restaurant that sits on top of this very tall building, and it's slowly turning. And so while you're eating, the whole room is turning. And you could look up, and 15 minutes later, you were looking east. And now you're looking west. And it's so gradual that it doesn't shake the table. You can have a whole conversation. The whole, not just the table, the whole room is turning. And without even noticing, you are suddenly facing in a whole different direction. That's what it's like. That's what backsliding is like. I was going in one direction. Now I'm going a totally different direction. It's slow. It's diminishing. It is the process of taking down. It is the process of lowering of standards. It is the process of, look at this, losing interest in truth. That's what's happening with the church. That the church, more or less, is losing interest in spiritual things. Losing interest in truth. And yet we're having a growing interest in the things that are not. That while we're diminishing in terms of study and devotion and prayer and relationship with God, we're having a growing interest in things that are not spiritual. Until the things that are not spiritual become more important to us. I don't want to make nobody mad. But anytime you spend more time watching a sports game than you do in your Bible... It is diminishing. Anytime you can spend two hours at a movie theater, at a movie that you can't even stand, and you're looking at your watch because you've been in church for more than 45 minutes. Anytime you can sit up and have a date sitting around with somebody for three hours that you're not even going to be bothered with tomorrow, but you can't spend 15 minutes in prayer or in study, it's diminishing. Y'all looking tight. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. If you enjoy those things, God bless you. I'm just saying by comparison, how much time do you spend in things that have to do with the spirit versus things that have to do with your flesh? Anytime it takes you an hour and a half to put your makeup on, but you can't stand to be in devotion for 10 minutes. Because as a church, not this church, church church-wide, Christian people, spirit-filled people, children of God are losing interest in spiritual things. It's boring. Who wants to do Bible study? Who wants to do discipleship classes? Who wants to be talking about the word of God? I want to get out there and do my thing. And so we are off balance. And so now we find ourselves in church rejecting the things that give us life while accepting the things that tend to death. And so Paul said, now wait, this is strange. Here's the word he used, who has bewitched you? That's a strong word. Who has bewitched you? It's from a Greek word that means to cast a spell on you. Yeah, you're acting like somebody who's hypnotized, play mind games. You become irrational and out of touch with reality. You walk around like somebody who has lost full faculty of their good sense. See, I got to go there. And here's what's weird. He's saying, it's, that's not like you. That normally you're a person who is focused, who is committed, who is standing up, who is there, who is involved, who is excited. Ooh, you're looking at somebody that when the first drum roll, you're on your feet clapping your hands. That normally you're not the last person to come to church. You're the first person at church. 
that normally you're the kind of person who always has energy and always is encouraging and always has a kind word, and now you're acting something different. This is not like you. I watch people that's like that. Sometimes I see, I take the temperature, and I'm saying, who are you today? Because they ain't consistent. See, see, yeah, you can't mess with me, Lee, because once you, you can't do something good for me. Because once you do something good for me, I expect to be that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I expect to be that all the time. When I'm asking people, how you doing? I'm checking the temperature. I'm not just saying to be nice. I'm being a shepherd. And I do it all the time. I'll call somebody, I'll be on my mind, and I'll call and say, how you doing? Oh, Pastor, I'm doing such, 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 such. Yeah, that's fine, but how you doing? You know what I'm doing? I'm checking. I'm checking. I'm checking the spirit. I'm checking the sheep. I'm checking to see how you are. And when something is off, and when something is weird, I start asking, what happened to you? What's going on here? Right? Because I'm trying to check it out. Sometimes, sometimes God will just have me pray about it. I'll know something, and I'll see, and I'll say, I'm just going to pray about it. Other times, God will say, I want you to say something to it. So I'll say something to the person directly, or I'll call them on the phone. And sometimes, I'll leave it alone and let them just receive the message through the preaching. And hopefully, through the preaching and through the teaching, they will receive what they need to address what they're dealing with. But either way, I'm checking because that's not like you. If I look at the way you praise God three months ago versus the way you worship God now, it's like night and day. And I'm looking over my glasses like Paul and say, who has bewitched you? Who's gotten in your head to the point that you are now acting out of character? Showing off. Anybody ever did that with your kids? Anybody have your kids ever come home and they start doing stuff that you know they don't do? I mean, they're dressing differently, they're acting differently, they're using terms and using slang, and you have to say, who, who you been hanging around? Is it just me? You send your kids out, you know how you train your kids. You know, they dress a certain way, they, they talk a certain way, they act a certain way, they have certain manners, and they come back in the house, and you have to say, wait, 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 baby, who you been? Hanging around. My, my grandson's mother called me last week and said to my grandson, he's about three years old, said my grandson got into an altercation at his school, <laughs> three years old, and got into an argument with one of his little classmates, and in the middle of the argument, he said some words. <laughs> that was inappropriate for a three-year-old to be saying. And my first question to her was, who he been hanging around? <laughs> Where'd he get that from? That's not how he talks. That's not how we talk around here. How in the world? And so I look at the saints, and I see them acting weird, and I see them acting funny, and I see them doing things that they wouldn't normally do, and I see them taking down standards, and I see them being disengaged. I start questioning who you've been hanging around. And I don't want going to get on, on the kids we talk about peer pressure for our kids all the time, but it happens to adults too. Let me help the young people out. I know they're telling tell you, if Jimmy jump off the bridge, you're going to jump too. They give you that whole speech. But let me tell you, adults deal with peer pressure too. True story, true story. I, I was working at a, at a, at a, at a ministry. I uh, shouldn't have said that, but anyway. I was working at a company <laughs> where we used to have executive meetings um, every Monday. Every month. It was a high-level executive meetings. And uh, it would be all of these executives in there. We would come in. We had our suits on. And it was, it was a diverse group, too. We discussed all the plans and the strategies and what worked, what didn't work. And we pray. We had this. It was really important to me. We did it every Monday. Every Monday. We sit down and we discuss, OK, what worked, what didn't work, where are we going, what's the plan. It was a diverse group. It was men in there. It was women in there. It was black, Hispanic, white in there. So we were all in this group, right? And so we were used to being professionals. We all came in our professional attire. It was jacket. It was tie. It was a professional atmosphere, and we would discuss the business of the ministry. And so we hired this new guy to be a part of our team. And bless God, this new guy had a, how do I put it, a very colorful way of talking. 
<laughs> so while we were used to having high level conversations and expressing our vast vocabulary and having conversations, this, this person was so colorful in their words uh, that every other sentence was uh, an expletive. Yeah, yeah. Every other, every other sentence was the N word. Yeah, he, every other word, every other sentence, he'd be dropping F bombs. In an executive meeting. And at first, we were shocked. Right, Connie? At first, we was clutching our pearls like, what did he just say? And he wouldn't be mad. This is just his normal vocabulary. He even talked to his wife like this. We was like, you know, yeah, she my N-word. She my, that's my, I'm like, oh. okay, all right then. Here's the thing. Nobody said anything about it. Nobody corrected it. Nobody fixed it. We were shocked and appalled. And we finally just said, well, that's just how they are. But guess what, Connie? After a while, we started talking like that. And now an executive meeting turns into a back alley conversation and a ballroom conversation. High level executive, suit, tie, and everything. Now we're talking like a bunch of kids in a bar because of the influence of one person. Don't, don't let me talk about it. Let me talk about me. I started talking like that. And I pride myself at being somebody who has a very vast vocabulary, and I speak slowly because I want to make sure nothing don't pop out my mouth. I normally try to think before I say what I'm going to say. Yeah, when I get ready to say something, Charlie, my head rolls like a Rolodex, and I can think of 15 things I should say, but I have to pick the right thing to say in this moment. Thus, I offend the people that I'm speaking to. The first rule of public speaking is know your audience. So, 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 so I pride myself at being somebody who would pick appropriate words to speak in this certain situation. But bless God, I found myself using those words. I was going home using those words. I was talking to my kids using those words. And so one of my sons got a nerve to be saying something that he shouldn't be saying and I corrected him and said, wait a minute, where'd you get that from? <laughs> right. And he looked at me and I thought, you're right. And I had to make a conscious effort to make sure that I don't use those words in my vocabulary whether we're having casual conversation or I'm angry because there's more words that you can use, but I'm just sharing with you how easily it slips in. And so that was the issue he was having with these Galatians. I left you speaking and thinking and feeling one way, and now you're thinking another way. And here was the problem. False teachers had come in, and they started telling them, you got to obey Moses' law to be saved and that you can't just receive it by faith. And it created conflict within them and caused a power shortage. Because anytime you have somebody challenging your thought processes in a negative way, you have to have enough internal fortitude to recognize something that is not true and reject it. You have, the devil's going to always come along and try to plant things in your mind. But you have to have enough mental discipline to say, I reject that. I don't receive that. Has anybody ever had somebody speak something negative over you and you knew they was wrong and you knew it didn't make no sense and you had to constantly shake your head and say, I don't receive that? I don't, you, you tell me I'm stupid, I don't receive that. You tell me I'm not delivered, I don't receive that. You tell me I can't be prosperous, I don't receive that. You have to have enough mental toughness in your own mind to be able to pull down imaginations and shut down things. The devil's always going to be around your mind trying to put things in your heart and put things in your spirit. You know you're not going to make it. You know Jesus is not coming. You know you're not going to come out of this. You know you're not going to get healed. You know you're going to always be broke. You know they don't like you you know they don't care about you and it's always swirling around your head to move you out of your place and you got to be tough enough and man enough and woman enough to say I rejected somebody shout I rejected you would be surprised the conversations that people in this room right now are having in this church where the devil's over in the corner telling you they don't even like you over here. They don't support you. They don't see you. The pastor don't even know your name. They don't even know where you are from. She didn't even speak to me. She didn't, she didn't shake my hand. And all these conversations be going on in your head to cause you to be shaken. But look at somebody and say, you're not going to shake me. Oh, 
you got to do better than that devil. You got to do better than hurt my feelings to run me out of here. You got to do better than talk about my shoes or my dress or my hair to get me out of here. Why is it that when we was in the club, people could say something bad about you and you came back every week doing your thing. But in church, if somebody talk about you or say something wrong to you, I'm not coming back to this church no more. The devil is a lie. Everything you receive, you got it by faith, not by human effort. Salvation, revelation, healing, miracles, peace, freedom, all those things you got by faith. What am I saying? You got it by an intimate relationship with God. Relationship over religion. You didn't get this by works. You didn't get this because you were smart. You didn't get this because you was educated. You didn't get this kind of power, this kind of peace because you had a degree. You got it because you bowed your knee and like Abraham, you received it by faith. Is there anybody in here who knows that everything you get, you got it by faith? Give God praise right here and thank God. Oh, I'm glad I got it by faith because truth be told, most of us wouldn't be qualified to get it. We ain't cute enough. We ain't smart enough. We're not educated enough. We came from the wrong side of the tracks. But because I can access God by faith, I can have just as much as anybody else. If what I'm saying is right, give God 30 seconds of your best praise. I'm so glad. I'm trying to hurry along. Well, listen, listen. To Paul... They were foolish. There's that word again. Foolish means just to be mentally drunk. To return to systems and processes and procedures that didn't work, you are foolish. To return to things that don't make no sense is foolish. To return to things that God had worked so hard to get you out of, my brother, is foolish. God took years to get your mind out of that hole, sister, to get you away from certain kinds of people, to get you away from certain kinds of men. He did a work on you. It took five years, but it was a process. And you are foolish to return to the things that God worked so hard to get you out of. It reminds me of people that came out, reminds me of Israelites coming out of Egypt and got out there in the wilderness and start crying, talking about, oh, we missed the leeks and onions in Egypt. Short-term memory. Isn't it funny, after you've been delivered for a while, the enemy starts telling you, oh, you're missing it, child. I miss the leeks and onions. Mm. Leeks and onions made it spicy. That's what they was basically saying. This manna out here in the wilderness is boring, is dry. And that's how many people approach church, Lee. That's why we got to spend so much money trying to pay for bands and equipments and singers because we're trying to entertain you and make you eat something that's palatable, trying to get your palate ready to receive truth. But I'm used to eating leeks and onions. I'm used to eating foolery. I would rather spend an hour watching them show off on Real Wives of, of Hollywood than listen to a preacher preach the word because it's spicy. Yeah, reality TV, it's interesting. Yeah, show me something on TikTok because it's interesting. And so the Israelites, they, they missed the leeks and, the, and all the flesh pots. In Egypt. Oh, man, we had it going on. You know why? Because in the midst of leeks and onions, they forgot about the whips. They forgot about that part. They left that part. They forgot about the enslavement. They forgot about being bound by a slave master that made you make bricks without straw. You forgot about the addiction that was terrorizing your body, messing up your money. Destroying your relationships. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You in church now and you bored and I'm ready to go back out to the world. At least the world is having fun. Please don't forget the addiction that had you fiending all night long trying to find a hit. See, y'all don't want to talk to me. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't forget. Don't forget how you spend your last dollar trying to get that alcohol bottle and lost your job and lost your promotion. And don't forget that your last marriage was messed up because you was out here acting crazy and doing inappropriate things. Don't, don't, don't get over here and forget. Don't get over here and lose your mind and get amnesia. We got to stop returning to things. And people 
that broke us. That's what I'm trying to say, Adrian. There's a tendency in us after you've been saved for a while and clean for a while, then it starts messing with your mind and you start remembering the thing because even when things are bad, there is always some little good about it. People say ain't no fun in sin. They lying. I don't know where you sitting at. <laughs> ain't no fun in sin. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a whole lot of fun in sin. Yeah, yeah. But you got to take the other part too. And so we forget about all the things that broke us. I'm talking to somebody here right now. You keep returning to people that broke you. Relationships that broke you. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I mean broke you. You had to go through years of counseling. Just be able to get up in the morning and smile. Broke you. Broke your heart, broke your spirit, wounded you to the point you were walking around like a zombie, didn't even know who you were or where you are. And God did a work in your life and he ministered to you and he washed you and he helped you and he stood you up. And one day you were standing strong. How dare you now return? Incidentally, incidentally, there's a psychology behind people who return to their abusers, by the way. They call it Stockholm Syndrome. And Stockholm Syndrome is where people develop a, like a deep bond and even a, 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 a positive feelings for their captors. There's a psychology behind people who, behind women in particular, who've been abused, who go back to their abusers. They're still trying to study why that is. Some of them do it because it's a safety mechanism. It's, it's dealing with the, with the situation. It's just coping with the situation. But whatever it is, there's a phenomenon where people have been kidnapped, people have been abused, people have been beat up all the time, and yet instead of getting away from their captor, sometimes they go back to their captor. Even to the point that when people try to arrest them, you will find the victim saying, no, 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 they're a nice guy. They're a nice person. They didn't mean it. Can I tell you something? When the devil got after you and wanted to destroy you, he wasn't playing. He meant it. He meant for you not to be here. He meant for you not to get up. He meant for you not to, he meant for you to stay in jail. He meant you to go from place to place from God to God and woman to woman. He ain't playing with you. Those of you who feel like playing with the devil, let me tell you something. He's not playing with you. That if God had stepped in, he would have destroyed you. But thank God he delivered you. Oh, God, I got to go. We baptize the people. He delivered you. So, so some people are stuck in a cycle where you get in, you get out. You get in, you get out. Has anybody ever prayed that prayer? Lord, if you get me out this one more time. <laughs> Lord, if you get me out this time, I won't go back to her. I won't do that no more. There you are, sitting up over top of a commode, throwing up your guts, saying, God, if you help me do this. I did it. See, y'all don't want no real pastor. Y'all want somebody giving y'all lofty preaching. I'm talking about somebody who was so high, you thought you was going to lose your mind, and you were praying while you was high, saying, God, if you just get me out of this, I won't go back. I won't do it no more. And as soon as it was over, child, when's the next party? Give me that bottle. Give me that. Y'all see y'all. But I came today to break the spell. It's a spell that the devil plays on your mind. It's a spell that the devil has over you that makes you go back to the thing and back and forth and back and forth. And I can always tell Charlene when they've been caught in a cycle because when they come in sometimes they're leaping and praising God and jumping. And yes, pastor, preach, pastor, do it, man. That's my word. And I don't see for three weeks because you back out there in the streets. Chasing that girl, chasing that. I, I'm done with him, child. I'm telling you right now, he better not call me. He, and then I look up next week. Child, we were just going through a thing. We was just, he's really a great person. I just, something about him. We got a connection in the spirit. God has ordained this from the foundation of the world. God has, um, forgot that he slapped you up against the refrigerator. 
forgot the fact that we just had him arrested last week. See, I've done this kind of stuff. I've done, see, I've done this stuff where people call you, Pastor, something's going on. He crazy. And I put on my Batman boots, Adrian, and go running down there and want to break it up. Getting all in the middle. Almost getting hurt myself from fool and foolery in your house. And now I'm all in them. I done left my wife home and kids. And I'm coming down there trying to straighten out your mess for somebody who go right back. Right back to the thing that we had to get you out of. I'm caught in a cycle. And I want to talk to somebody in here right now who's caught in a cycle. And maybe you're not caught in a cycle of abuse, but you're caught up in a habit that you can't break. An addiction that you can't break. And we can't see it because you do it secretly. Secretly involved in porn. Secretly angry with people. Secretly lying to people. Secretly doing undercover things. We can't see it up front. Y'all are dressed up in here right now. But I'm dealing with things I have to be shh quiet about it. Nobody has to see it. And when I come to a good church service, God delivers me and he helps me and he breaks the yoke and he breaks the chain. And that lasts for about two weeks. But then I'm back to doing the stuff that I shouldn't. Oh, am I talking to anybody in here that I shouldn't be doing? Look at somebody and say, break the cycle. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. Look at somebody and say, break the cycle. God has done too much for you for you to go back to who you was. God has done too much for you to be, to be broke like that. God has done too much in your life. Is there mm-hmm. anybody in here who's glad that God has done a real work in your life that you can say to somebody, I ain't never going back to that? Break the spell. God said in one place, he said, I will heal your backsliding way. For those of you who tend to be good church workers, then you backslide. And then I'm good this week, but then you backslide. But then I'm faithful and I'm committed, but then you backslide. I'm faithful with tithing and giving. Now I backslide. God says, I want to heal. Lift your hands right here over this building. God says, I want to heal your backsliding ways. Oh, my God. I'm going to heal your attitude about money. You're not going to be broke no more. Being broke is a mentality. It's not about what's in your money. It's not about what's in your bank account. It's about what's in your head. That loneliness won't drive you back to a place. Oh my God, I got to get out of here. That depression won't drive you to a place. You know, loneliness will drive you to a place. It'll drive you into the arms of somebody that's not good for you. It'll put you in places where you shouldn't be because God wants to break the spell over your life. I like what Paul said in Galatians 5 and 7. He used a different metaphor. He said, you did run well. That's what he said. Galatians 5 and 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you? Am I talking to anybody in here? Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. You ever seen it? You, you, you started out good. You ever, you ever seen it? They start out serving. Start out as a Christian. And they run it. Ain't no stopping me now. I'm coming out of it. I'm going to do better. I'm going to live better. I'm going to be better. I'm starting out good. That's what I did. And then after a while, you see them, and they're not running, but they're walking. I started out running. That's what Paul said. But now I'm just kind of walking. Charlene, almost like meandering. <laughs> walking through this Christian life. Then they go to stopping. I'm not running. I'm not walking. I just stopped. But you ain't done yet. Now they're sitting. Isn't it funny how there are some people that I've seen who've been on fire. On fire to serve. On fire to work for God. On fire to live for God. Who started out running. Then they start walking. And finally end up sitting. Sitting in the house of God. I mean people who have gifts, have talents, have abilities, have a calling, who know God has a calling on their life. They feel the presence of God. And now I'm sitting. You did run well. Who has hindered you that now you are sitting? In fact, how can you be so happy sitting in the house of God? Taking down to you are sitting 
in a place. Anybody ever been in something that you know you shouldn't be in and your head saying I shouldn't be there, but my body saying I'm comfortable sitting. Everything in me knows that I should be better than this. But I've taken down to the point that now I've gone from running to sitting. Couple things, I'm almost done. Number one, you gotta refocus. Because I'm not sitting because I'm tired. I'm not sitting because I'm tired. I'm sitting because I'm distracted. I'm disengaged. Uh, and it always bothers me to see somebody who is running, suddenly sitting, not because they're tired, because I'm distracted. Number one, you got to refocus. You got to refocus. Sometimes we lose sight of the most important things. He said Christ was crucified right in front of you. You saw it. You know what the story is. You know what the deal is. We focus on things that don't matter. Look at this, at the sacrifice of things that do. How many times have we done it? You're putting energy into all the things that don't matter. Conversations, all these things that you're putting all your body, your strength, your energy into at the sacrifice of the things that do. And then other times, we just, we frankly just lose clarity. Anybody here need glasses? Either to see or to read? I found that when I wear my glasses, it's not that I can't see. It's just the objects are not clear. Anybody hear what I'm saying? It's not that I can't see. I can see, but I can't make out distinctives. I can't make out clearly what I'm looking at. I keep putting my glasses on while I'm reading, because if I take my glasses all off, I just see letters on a page, but I can't make out what's there. I can't make out distinctives. And so what happens in your spiritual life sometimes is that you just lose focus. You focus on the wrong things. Even when you sit in a service like this, you're focusing on the wrong things. Who played the song? What's the pastor wearing? Is it hot in here? Is it cold in here? What's the band like? What's the stage look like? We're focused on all the wrong things. Here's what I want to tell you, beloved of God. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember whose you are. And remember who you are becoming. Oh, my God. The whole reason you're disengaged and disinterested is that you've lost focus. You've lost focus. You're focusing on stuff that don't matter. That has nothing to do with your eternal salvation. You lost focus. It amazes me the number of people who suddenly have something to do on Sunday morning. You're only here one day a week. It ain't like you hear five days a week, three Bible studies. You hear one Sunday, and everything that comes up just happens to come on Sunday when you need to be focused. Oh, I'm stepping on toes. Y'all don't like that. Number two, <laughs> yeah, number two, you're gonna have to readjust. You know, when they make cars, cars are designed so that there's equal weight distribution on all your tires, right? For you to have a smoother, safer driving experience, for it to be smooth while you're driving, they make it so that the weight is distributed amongst all the tires. In other words, they all have alignment. And when they're not, steering becomes a problem. You ever had it happen to you? When your car's out of alignment, it starts pulling. And you could take your hand off the wheel, and without you even doing anything, your car will start veering in a certain direction because it's out of alignment. Same thing is true about you. When, as, as a body, when we work, when the work is not evenly distributed, even a body like this, when the work is not evenly distributed, what happens is all of the work falls on a few people. Oh, okay. Come on. That's good. It falls on a few people, while the vast majority of people are doing nothing. And whenever you have all the work fall on a few, but it doesn't engage us all, we're not impactful as we should be. We can't leave the job of winning souls to just the pastor. I got up a few minutes ago and I said, my praise team is not up here, but now you're going to become my praise team. 
Because we can't leave the responsibility of going into worship to a few hand-picked people when all of us were called to worship. The Bible said that the body is edified or strengthened by that which every joint supplies. That every person you see, God has put something in them that calls you to come and give something and not just take something. What am I saying? I'm designed to be a participator and not just a spectator. And I may not preach and I may not sing and I may not play the drums and I may not usher. But one thing I do have is praise that if I don't do nothing, I can give God a praise. Come on for 30 seconds. Give God a, at least give God a praise. At least thank him for what he's done. I may not be able to preach like Paul or sing in the choir. But one thing I can do is give God a praise. Somebody open your mouth and say, I'm giving him a praise right here. Lee, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something, young man, that messed me up in church for a long time. I used to think that when you come to church, that God would give you a dance. Did you think that too? That if you get in the presence of God, that God will come down and give you a dance. And I'd see people leaping and clapping, or I would think that God would make my hands clap. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit would come down on me, and suddenly I would be clapping out of control. That's what I thought. I was brought up in the street. I ain't known about this church stuff. I just saw people running when nobody was chasing them. I just saw people walking around talking and wasn't nobody talking to them. I just saw people say, grab the back, say, oh! <laughs> Y'all remember that in the old church? Oh! Oh, man. And I thought, ooh, the Holy Ghost and got them. I did. I thought that. <laughs> and so I sat in church, a newly saved Christian, waiting for God to give me a dance. This is the Sunday. And everybody be going in. Ooh, child. And I'm sitting there, God, give me a dance. Give me a dance. Oh, I want to dance. Look at that. That looks like so much fun. Look at her leaping. Look at her clap. Got tears coming down her face and having a good time. Lord, give me a dance. It took me a long time to realize that praise is not something God gives you. Praise is something you give him. Y'all don't hear me up in here. So you waiting for God to give you a praise, but in reality, God is waiting for you to give him a praise. Come before his presence with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God. Somebody that's glad God did something in your mouth. Take a moment right here and give God a praise. You gonna sit there after everything God did for you? After he pulled you out the club? After he healed your heart, after he blessed your kids, you gonna sit there, you ain't got no more than that. You ain't got no more than that. You ain't got no more than that. For the king of kings and the Lord. Oh, I got to go, I got to go. Would you slap about three people and say, this is what I do. This is what I do. You ain't got to make me do it. I came to do it. I came. Somebody clap your hand like you done lost your mind. Somebody leap up and down like you done lost your mind. Somebody shout like you done lost your mind. Yeah. Oh, we get ready to baptize people in a minute. Somebody shout hallelujah. Sit down, sit down. Let that thing I'm done. For real, for real, for real. Quite frankly, number three, if you're going to get back to the place that God has called you, quite frankly, beloved, you're going to have to resign. And I'm not talking about resigning from church. I'm not talking about resigning from church membership or service. I'm talking about you have to resign from sin, a sinful lifestyle. You got to renounce some things. You got to stand up and say, I quit. This is no conversation needed. This is no compromise. This is no middle ground. I'm shutting down some things. I resign. Look at somebody say, I resign. I resign. 
when I gave my life to Jesus, I served the devil my resignation. I said, I'm out of here. I'm never coming back. Told the dope man, you won't see me no more. Told the liquor store, you won't see me no more. Told that girl, I ain't going to see you no more. They thought I was crazy. They thought something was wrong with me. But I resigned. I left. I got out of something. Is there anybody in here that God has got you out of something and you're glad about a holler at your boy listen in a few minutes in a few minutes we're about to baptize candidates water baptism symbolizes the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ it symbolizes his death. They hung him on a cross and they buried him in a tomb. But it wasn't over yet. In three days, he was resurrected. And so when we get water baptized, it's not just a ceremony we do in church. We are saying to the devil, I quit. When we put them down in the watery grave, the expectation is that they will rise up out of that water walking in newness of life. Walking with a different attitude. We don't do it for ceremony. We're saying to the world. We're saying to our family. We're saying to our friends. I'm saying to my enemies that that part of me is over. Who I was is no longer a lie. Let the past be the past. And what you see coming up out this water is a whole new person. Is there anybody in here that remember the day that you went down in Jesus' name? You don't act like it. You don't act like a new person. See, my old person would have been mad and hateful but this new person knows how to give God praise and give God oh my God we're giving up the world every quarter we're baptizing people in Jesus name who have said publicly I'm giving up the world see here's my problem I gotta go see as Christians we're losing our distinctives and instead of us influencing the world the world is influencing us. Truth be told, instead of us talking, oh, I'm out here trying to influence the world, I doubt very seriously if Jesus would have been sitting around a hookah bar. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I doubt if he would have been sitting up in a cigar bar, my God, sipping on some cognac, talking about I'm just trying to win souls for Jesus. I don't know. We're losing our distinctives. We're, <laughs> I done stepped on about 15 people's toes now. Yeah, we're losing our distinctives, and they're influencing us. What we wear, where we go. Anytime stripper culture becomes normal in church, we got a problem. Don't, don't preach that hard face. You, you done made them mad. Yeah, anytime. The th the, listen, the things that we would be ashamed of 20 years ago has now become normal. It's like the story I told you about the coworker I had. You know what the problem was, Adrian? We normalized bad behavior. Used to be if you did something bad. It's not that we didn't do stuff bad, Brother Michael. We did stuff. We did stuff, but we felt bad about it. If you slept with somebody you weren't supposed to sleep with, we felt bad about it. If you cussed somebody out, you felt bad about it. If you were smoking something or drinking something, you felt conviction. Now we don't feel conviction. It's like, child, whatever. Don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Instead of us influencing the world, they are influencing us. But today I want to declare, I quit. I resign. I'm out. I'm turning in my membership. Isn't it funny, Adrian, that we can give up good things easily, but bad things we struggle with. Anytime something's good for you, even when it comes to food, good food, I don't want that. But bad food, oh child, give me that, give me that gravy, give me that sugar. I don't care if I get cholesterol, it just tastes good. That's how sin is. And it's hard for us to give up things that are good. And so easy. So, 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 so we'll get mad and stand outside a club for three hours in the freezing rain just to get in the dance for an hour. But we won't take a moment to come to church. Because the stuff that helps us, we ignore. I'll quit my membership at your church before I quit my membership at the club. Yeah. 
Ain't that funny? They could be shooting, fighting, arguing, cussing, and everything. And I'll be back next Friday, yo. It was crazy, but I'm coming back. But in church, I got to check off all these boxes. Got to have all this and all that before I come. And if one of those boxes don't check off, I'm out of here. But instead of resigning on your God and resigning on your church, you need to resign from living in a lifestyle that does not glorify God. Look at somebody say, I quit. And so God is showing us the blueprint for success. He says, let us not be weary in well-doing. I know what it's like to get tired. I know what it's like to stop wanting to be diligent. Anybody ever got tired of being diligent? I'm diligent. I'm diligent. I'm watching. But anybody ever got tired? But the word of God says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. It's been a struggle, but I'm going to keep on going. I've been tired some time, but I'm going to keep on going. I almost didn't come to church today, but I came anyway. I decided when I got here, I'm just going to sit there and endure it. But I made up my mind I'm going to praise God anyway. My money is funny, but I'm going to praise him anyway. My friends done left me, but I'm going to praise him anyway. If there's anybody in here that's got an anyhow spirit down in you, I'm going to praise him. Oh, my God. I'm going to praise him anyhow. My back is tired, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. I had a fight all the way over here, but I'm going to pray. Oh, Lord. Slap the people and say, anyhow, 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 anyhow. Anybody here got a fight with the devil right now? Anybody got something you battling with right now? Anybody going through something that's a struggle right now? Anybody having to throw your sleeves up and pull out your dukes? Look at somebody say, I'm going to praise him anyhow. This is how you fight back. This is how you do it. This is how you make it. What are you doing, preacher? I'm trying to raise up a church that doesn't depend on your feelings before you have church. Okay, y'all don't want no church. Y'all, y'all, I got, let me go on home. I'm done. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to raise up mature enough Christians that you don't have to have plenty of money and you don't have to feel good and you don't have to have a new boo and you don't have to get a new job. But if I don't get any of that, I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to get you older saints to teach the newer saints how you're supposed to walk this thing out. Somebody that made up your mind to praise him anyway, jump up on your feet and say, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Y'all not doing it. Y'all not doing it. My knee hurt, but I'm going to praise him anyhow. Hey, I got a headache, but I'm going to praise him. Yeah. Find you three people and say, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you, you ain't doing it. Can't find somebody and say, this is how you do it. I done grabbed me a tambourine and shown you how to do it. My band is starting to play like they lost their mind because this is how you do it. you have church. This is how you put your foot on the neck of the devil. Somebody give God a shout in here. You ain't got no better praise than that. All the things God brought you out of, you ain't got no more than that. You, you, you. You have more energy than that in the club. You have more energy than that at the football game. You ain't got no more. Come on and put those hands on him. Yeah.
Hallelujah. Somebody lift him up. 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 your hands and give God a praise right here. Bow your heads just a minute. While we prepare to transition, bow your head and close your eyes just a moment.